Okay. That is it. I've had it. Recap, don't barge into my office like that. High school DXD? Oh, come on, Recap. You can't tell me you're surprised. No, I'm not. That's why I'm pissed off. We have to do it. For the fans, yeah, I get it. But sir, I have so much more talent than this. I can do so much more than just borderline hentai. Recap, if you don't want to do it, I can always replace you. With who? What is up, cappers? It is I, Mr. Recap. What the hell is this? Your future if you don't do this recap. I am Mr. Recap. Today we are talking about incest, 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 Is it gonna incest, stop? Incest, Not until incest, its incest, incest quota incest, is matched. Incest, Why does it need an incest, incest quota? Incest, incest, incest. Alright, fine, I'll frackin' do it. <clears throat> Meet Issei Hiodo. Which I can guarantee all of you, every single one of you frackin' weeb degenerates knows who this guy is. Because Issei here is one of us. We are one of him. He says what we're all thinking. At least if you're still a virgin. So basically still you then. This guy made a whole new type of anime protagonist. Hashtag prove me wrong. The first line from this man is, I want to squeeze some opi. A very important cultured message here because that is his whole Frackin' arc. He, along with his two friends, Motohama and Matsuda, one of whom looks like his design was not even frackin' complete, enrolled in Kuo High School for one reason and one reason only. Put their grand plan of being a male student and having a harem is not going as smoothly as they thought it would. To add insult to injury, there is another guy straight from a BL light novel named Kiba, who is basically the center of all lady attention. I thought these guys only thought of getting laid, but no, they're literal frackin' creepers, peeking into changing rooms through holes. They're not even creative about it. Issei gets caught during one of these and is swiftly handed his ass by a bunch of ladies, all while in... Oh boy, there she is. This right here, gentlemen, and also still gentlemen, is a smoking hot redhead named Rius Gremory. This waifu right here defined an entire nation of weebs. She united weebs from across the globe to unite behind her cause. Look at her. Look at her and tell me she can't end wars with a kiss. I swear, bro, it's like she injects protein into her boobs directly. She is the president of the Occult Research Club. Motohama explains as he uses his latent powers of x-ray vision to carefully estimate her bodily measurements. <laughs> what? I remember when I first watched this show when I was in ninth grade, and immediately after this scene, they had Rius undress with her breasts defying gravity on her every step. It was then that something awoke inside me. I became... A degenerate. Others call it cultured. That's what I used to call it just 50 videos ago. Have we really made like over 50 videos? Now I know what you're thinking, Mr. Recap, where's the shower scene? Well, here it is. She takes these a lot, so be prepared to get wet. After having a riveting rough day at school, Issei is confronted by a random girl on a bridge who just calls out his name for some reason. I've been noticing you. She tells him, which is understandable because of that stupid red shirt of his. Basically, she asks to be his girlfriend. <laughs> That's the most basic looking red shirt I've seen. How can you hate that? Because it's basic. And if I ain't one thing familiar, it is basic. Basic. Got that right. Similar to what my therapist told me after he said I was cured of my depression, this is too good to be true. There's no way this is happening without a good, bad, or I don't fucking know some messed up reason. And so, our boy has a girlfriend now. Amino Yuma. Motohama and Matsuda could not believe it. And if I were them, I couldn't either. Look at her. Look at him. Look at her. And look at his shirt. I swear you're nitpicking. They even decide to go on a weekend date. For some reason, though, Rius Gremory has had some of her underlings keep a close eye on him constantly, keeping track of all of his movements. While waiting for Yuma, a woman passes him one of those advertisement flyer thingies. Why is that important? The burp or the advertisement? Don't fiddlestick me, you know what I mean. Well, Familiar, you got onto me about not including everything in a recap, so there you go, I included everything. Someone's butt hurt. Okay, maybe that isn't important, right? But what is important is all the, and here it comes, FUN LITTLE THING! 
things that they're about to do. I feel so sorry for my neighbors. Come on, guys. You know I had to say that when a date happens in an anime because all of them happen the same way. You buy some clothes, buy some games, and ice cream is a must. Some awkward hand-holding here and there. And then at the very end of the day, a demon comes along and stabs you through the heart. I definitely missed some context. Yep. As the day ends, Zuma holds his hands and then asks him if he was willing to do a favor for her. Man is totally ready to lean in for a kiss, but then she comes close to him and whispers, Could you die for me? Did I not tell you? Did I not tell you? There is no way on God's green feckin' earth you are getting a girl wearing a bright red t-shirt under your uniform. For Pete! Sake, man, that's not why! Yuma, or at least whom we thought was Yuma, turns into a fallen angel. A very dangerous, menacing, and strangely arousing being. She really doesn't waste any time and instantly impales him using an energy bolt. That was not in the job description. What was the job? Even in death, the only thing this guy can think of is how wonderful her opi would have felt before death. <laughs> Chad! I hate the mindset, but you gotta respect the grind set. Can I get a hell yeah? Hell no! Just before he takes his last breath, the flyer from earlier launches itself into the air and out pops Rhea's Gremory and her opi. Wow, those frickers can't stop shaking. See, Familiar, I told you the flyer was relevant. I'm pretty sure you didn't. Issei then wakes up in his bed the next day thinking it was all a bad dream. He still believes Yuma is pretty real and talks to his friends about it, but they seem to know nothing of her. My man's feeling so out of this world that he can't even pay attention to the hentai games that they're playing. That's how you know something's off. In a strange daze, he asks his friends to turn off the room lights and heads home. On his way home, he starts to realize that he can see better at dusk than he can during the afternoon, and for some reason, he can also hear people who are almost 100 meters away. He heads back to the place where Yuma originally killed him, and yet another man with malicious intent approaches him. This is another one of those fallen angels, and he does the exact same thing Yuma did and impales him. Just when he's about to land the final blow, Rias puts a halt to this little hunt and kindly warns the fallen an angel to piss off. It's not just her. The entire lady gang pulls off with some crazy power and begins to smoke them. Yet another day of waking up and feeling like everything's a dream, except this time it's not just Issei in his bed, but a naked Rius who wakes up and casually tells him that she is a demon. That wasn't in the job description, but I wouldn't be complaining. What is the job? May I introduce you all to the plot? Issei finds it hard to grasp at first, mostly because there are other important things to pay attention to right now. Really? For him, I would think that those two plot points would be the biggest things to pay attention to right now. They then go to school together, and not a single soul in that school is happy about the fact that Issei is walking with her. I get why they'd feel that way. That shirt is atrocious. ENOUGH WITH THE SHIRT! In class, she sends someone to fetch him for a more detailed explanation, and this envoy turns out to be Kida. Of course, all the popular and beautiful students of the school are either demons or their lackeys. We're finally at the occult research club room, and it's pretty occult, all right. Candles and stuff. And a lolly. Can't ever miss the lolly, can they? Her name is Konako, and bro, stop gawking at her. She's a freckin' child. So, where's Rius, you ask? She's taking a shower. Like I said before, that's all she does here. Ooh! Would you look at that silhouette? I don't know how much of this we're gonna actually be able to show, so I apologize, and I'm doing you a favor both at the same time. And finally, there's the vice president of the club, Himijima Akino, and the best girl of the show, I will take that to my grave! Tell me, does any other wife who have 4D jiggle physics? No, I don't think so. Hey, I thought you were in the blondes. How can I say this? She's blonde in all the right places. <laughs> They don't waste much time explaining to him the basic layout of what's been going on. The wankers with black feathers are fallen angels. The ones with white are angels. And finally, those with cartoon wings are demons. He found it quite hard to digest at first, but then she shows him a picture of himself and Yuma, whom he wished he could have stabbed with his sword, if you know what I mean. But it ended up being the other way around. She tells him that he has been blessed by the sacred gear, a strong divine weapon that also painted a target on his back. 
I wonder if God or whoever distributed this gear had a plan for it. Like, you'd think before giving it to a perverted regular teenager in a bright red shirt. After the Frickers show off their cartoon wings, he finally comes to terms with the fact that he is indeed a demon now. Rius makes it clear that she is a high-class demon, and he's just a low life, even in the demon community. But do you think he cared? No, and I'll tell you why. Actually, I don't need to tell you why. You already know what this dude's about. He has been given the opportunity to be around Rius and Akino 24-7 pretty much. It doesn't get much better than that if you're Issei. If you're Issei. If you're anyone. Unless you're afraid of women. Oh, don't argue semantics with me, man. You know dang well that no one's afraid of women. I don't know, man. Have you been married? Have you? Familiar, I'm married to the craft. And that's why you haven't been married to a woman! Issei's new life as a demon servant is basically complete contracts with humans. Get points and the reward is some booby time with Rius. Sounds good enough to me. There are booby contracts in real life? On his way back from completing a contract, he gets attacked by yet another fallen angel. But this time, he knows that there's a shonen protagonist trait hiding deep with inside him. In a fit of rage, he calls upon the ancestral Power Rangers and summons a toy in his hand. This toy is the sacred gear. But come on, man. Really? A Power Ranger hand design? That's the best we can do! Okay, well, actually, I thought it was pretty cool when I was a kid. <laughs> Next up is a fateful encounter with a nun. That starts with a great shot of her back just exposed to whoever was walking past her, and of course, that was Issei. Meet Asia Argento, a new nun appointed to this church, and wow, she sure is cute. I wonder if something bad were gonna happen to her in the future. She's blonde. If anything bad happens, she'll be doing it to herself. Hey, calm down, man. You know I have a thing for blondes. And that's exactly why I'm gonna keep dogging on him. Asia is no ordinary nun, however. She comes with the power to mildly heal wounds, but when she uses it around Issei, he feels a sharp pain in his hand. He starts to take her on a walk far enough enough to see the church and parts ways after getting an eerie feeling. Yeah, I get eerie feelings from churches all the time. Are you a demon? Are you? Saying are you there doesn't really work. You don't work. I freaking. So churches are apparently a hostile territory for demons and members of the church come equipped with sacred gear themselves, some of which are capable of exercising demons completely. They are finally on their first mission ever since Issei joined, and the task is to take down a stray demon. During this, Rius explains to him the hierarchy of the Gremory family's little group. She is the king, if that wasn't obvious, Akino is the queen, Konako is the rook, and Issei is the pawn because he's lame. And also, pawns can be quite OP under special circumstances. They're all based off of chess pieces. No! And in case it wasn't obvious, this is the demon! Actually, I don't know if the editor's gonna be able to show what the demon looks like. <laughs> okay, if you can see the demon, that's it. If you can't, Lucky you. In case you can't see it, I'll start describing what it's doing. They, they they start fondling their breasts after seeing the enemy, because that's just what demons do. It seems like a legit strategy. It, it starts shooting acid out of its nipples. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. That's the demon. That's a demon thing. I remember that from the Broble. They could have taken it down in a single shot and put an end to all of our suffering, but not until everyone had their moment. Keep it as a flashy sword thing, cause night and all, and Konako starts to manhandle the demon with her super strength. Just shoot it in the head, guys. I'm scared of becoming aroused. Akino lands the final blow using her lightning to literally toast the demon. And once again, I ask, why couldn't you have started with that? So Akina's a sadist. She just got better. One of Issei's trips to a client doesn't go as well as he had planned. Instead of being served tea, he is served fresh blood with a priest waiting as if he knew a demon was coming, which he totally didn't. Fried Zelzen, a young priest and an exorcist on behalf of the church, and looks like he enjoys his job a bit too much. Just when he's about to make quick work of Issei, Asya interrupts him with a moan of all things. Wouldn't have it any other way. She isn't very happy to know that Issei is actually a demon, but like I said, she is innocent, as she decides to save Issei. Yeah, something bad's about to happen. As a form of punishment, Lord Freed undresses her in a very violent manner and attempts to pass heavenly love into her body. Please do not say it like that again. 
So fortunately, the Gremory house arrives in the nick of time, but actually does nothing. They don't help anyone. They just take Hisei and they leave. They don't even kill the freed guy. Back in the club room, and the first thing Rias does after healing Issei is, you guessed it, shower time. Naturally, he asks why they didn't help Asia, and Rias makes it clear that she might be the most innocent person in the world. But the church is still their enemy, and anyone associated with the church is the same. Next thing we know, he has a random encounter with Asia in the park, and I am thoroughly surprised the church has not taken any form of action against her. These people have so many things to worry about, so much misunderstanding and bad blood to deal with, but no, instead, they decide to make it a date and have a blast. Gotta give him props, I can't freaking do that. You can't do what, have a date? She shares her story about having powers from birth, unknowingly helping a demon, and getting cast as a heretic by the church. You know, as soon as you use your powers freely, it's witching time. It really is a sweet moment between these two, getting to talk like that despite their allegiances, but I can't help but cringe at this awful shirt collection this guy has. Okay, dude, that, it's not even funny. What do you have against shirts? Wait, when did you take your shirt off? Their little conversation is interrupted by Yuma. Oh, haven't seen her in forever. And it could have stayed that way and I wouldn't have complained. Asia addresses her as Lady Rainier, so I'm guessing she's pulling the strings behind the church in this town. This time, Issei is ready to throw some hands and whips out his sacred gear, to which she just laughs at, calling it a joke of a weapon. It simply doubles your power. Given that context, Issei's power is basically just the number one on a scale of like, a thousand, so his weapon makes it two. <laughs> yeah, I'd laugh too. Man, if that power applied to my cool factor, I'd be freaking unstoppable. Zero times two is still zero. He doesn't care though. With determination in his eyes, Issei roars boost and gets a surge of immense power. He then gets impaled again and is down for the count. Yuma gives Asia the choice to leave with her in exchange for Issei's life, and she does so. So of course he goes running with his tail between his legs back to Rias, who instead of helping, gives him a slap across the face. I am loving this. This isn't the case for long. After explaining to him that the pawn is actually a pretty powerful piece, she leaves the room, leaving Issei the choice to go by himself. In a change of scenario, Kiba offers to join in to help him, and so does Konika, whereas Rias and Akino actually went near the church area to deal with some extra trouble. The team has no real strategy or anything. They just kick open the door and barge right in. Freed immediately takes it upon himself to welcome them. And uh, how? How? How is this one dude with just a sword and a gun keeping up with two physically and magically superior demons? Kiba pulls out his sacred gear and changes the color of his sword, which I don't know. I don't know what did that, but it looks cool, I guess. Issei promotes himself to a rook and finally, finally takes out a single enemy. Frick! Also, since when could he do that? I don't get to go around promoting myself when I feel like it. Yeah, because you don't have a job. This counts as a job. Try telling that to the government. You know what? I will. Go ahead. Go ahead and tell them that you recap hentai for a living. I I'm sure that'll work wonders for them. It's not hentai. It's borderline hentai. That makes it better. They head further down into the basement where Asia is hung. Probably to be sacrificed. I don't know why that was funny to me. Hey, was she gonna be sacrificed to some fracking demon while Yuma prepares a, a ritual? The sacrifice ritual. Yeah, okay. Right. Their goal is to take away her sacred gear, which would lead to her death. And they actually do it quite fast, like in an instant, with no chance to save her or anything. She just dies. Yuma takes the sacred gear for herself, aiming to become one of the supreme fallen angels, which is such an ironic name. All y'all already fell. Being the supreme of someone who fell is just like being the supreme Big Mac. Like you're still gonna give someone diabetes. <laughs> I am the supreme pedophile. Good job, man. You get a spot right at the top of the sex offender registry. Put all the letters in gold. You earned it. Asya isn't quite dead actually, and still has a bit of life left inside her. Yuma then changes her voice and personality back to when she fooled Issei and mocks the life out of him. I thought he'd just turn up and start blasting her here, but no, he just yells her name and starts running with Asya in his hands. Poor guy, he's actually getting berated quite hard. All the while, Asya is just dying in his arms. Oh, 
Ooh. Taking her away from harm didn't really matter because, well, she dies immediately after they exit the dungeon. Just so you know, Rias and Akino are out playing. Do I be serious or do I let my people die? Seriously, what's the point of playing defense all the time? Just get in there, get your hands dirty, get those nails bloody. Yuma catches up to Issei and starts to berate him again, putting Asia's death on his shoulders, calling him weak and insolent, which is kind of true. I mean, his point in life up till now has been Opai, and spoiler alert, it ain't gonna change. Now that would make anyone a weaker human being, but Issei doesn't operate under logic and he gets stronger from it. He finally starts to swing his fists, and you know what happens after that? A lightsaber impales him, and he's just done again. Psych! He's actually not dead. He takes the saber out of his hands and continues fighting anyway. So his sacred gear evolves like a freaking Pokemon and turns just a wee bit cooler, gives him more power, and freaks the lady out so much that she finally cowers a bit. Only after he beats the fallen angel do his comrades arrive to help him, knowing full well that he might have failed to beat his opponent, and could have died, some family they are, Rias recognizes Issei's sacred gear to be a red dragon. I'll admit it's a cool name, especially when the guy insists on wearing that freaking shirt. All right, there you go. You accepted it. Now you can stop bringing it up. Never! But it's no normal red dragon. Actually, one of them legendary sacred gears with a fracking monstrous dragon inside of it with powers capable of surpassing God and Satan themselves. Yeah, give that power to a fracking horny teenager in high school. Yep. Mm-hmm. Seems legit. In a final attempt to win, Yuma changes back to their date outfit and tries to play Issei into saving her. Wait, how did- when did she get the chance to do that? My man was not having any of that and tells Rias to put an end to her once and for all. She's a thought killer! While it is a happy ending, Asya's still dead. So. Rias uses her bishop chess piece to revive her as a demon and the new member of the Gremory family. Life suddenly gets a lot more convenient for Issei. Not only is Asia a demon now, and alive, she now lives in Issei's house because, you know, he's got to protect her. And, well, you know. And it's not a hentai. No, it's not. I look on the bright side, man. At least there hasn't been any incest yet. Did someone say incest? Well... What? Ah, frick, it's back. Wait, I think that's a different one. I am Mr. Recap, and I love incest. What? Oh, wow, man, I didn't know that about you. Familiar, it doesn't even sound like me. That's a female bot. And? Incest is my favorite flavor of ice cream. Okay, now it's getting weird. Where was I? Oh, yeah, uh, Asi is a demon now. She's still wearing the nun attire. Why? To top it all off, she's also the new transfer student in Issei's class. You cannot break this rule. No matter what, you can't break this one. What do you even mean? Her progress at the club is actually much better than Issei's. She's really adapting to this demon life. No wonder the church couldn't use her that well. Issei, on the other hand, has still not formed his first official contract with a human. So Rias gives him a small condition where he would get to touch her balloons if his first contract is a success. After a long day of meeting samurai cosplayers and doing the most random stuff, Issei finally manages to pull his first contract with a human. This brings us to the highlight of the day. He prepares himself to prowl upon years of nutrition nutrition and protein condensed into one whole package. That's gross. Oh, don't you fucking start with me now! But it's never as simple as that, is it? The rest of the club members arrive just in time to interrupt. Rias hugs him instead, and that's all my man gets for a whole day's effort. Very anticlimactic to end the episode, but whatever. And that's where we're going to leave it off today, cappers. What the frick? She's making us sound like all the other recap channels. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons and tell me how much you like incest. Except for that part. These bots' obsessions with incest is at an unhealthy high. Yeah, it was funny at first, but now it's just scary. Boss Cap, what the hell, man? Uh, yeah, I may have some more tweaking to do on it. You don't need it! <laughs> oh, Recap, you have no idea what I need. That wasn't ominous. Speaking of ominous, who here likes? Incest, 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 incest,